So as Mark said, we're gonna go through kind of the, the recommendations that the department is bringing to the board and also go through the framework that is available to us. And just as he mentioned, we are part of the Atlantic Flyway and as he said, 17 states and we have three major provinces, Ontario, Quebec and the Atlantic Provincial Region that we work together and have meetings uh, together twice a year. One primarily to go over the research and uh, joint ventures for habitat projects that are ongoing. And the other is to set the framework recommendations that go to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Some of the areas that are surveyed, both we have the Eastern Survey area that is primarily in Canada, uh, flight transects that they go through and parts of Maine. And then we also have uh, the Northeast pair plot surveys but those were not able to be conducted this year because of COVID and the concerns of bringing the disease to the uh, native peoples of Northern Quebec and the Arctic. So all we had was available to us was satellite data and that showed that it was a later phenology on the spring this year, which is never a good uh, case because generally the snow stays longer than and the ice stays longer and we don't have the production for those Arctic nesting birds. So a lot of what we're gonna be going over this year again is the same information that we had last year and they're gonna be using, some, they use predictive models. And so what I'm showing here is just the general overall population estimates for all ducks together, which is above that dotted line, which is the long-term average. We're estimating that there's somewhere around 39 million birds within the bird production areas. And then again, this is just a picture of those two survey areas, just quickly showing where the extent of the surveys. Within Vermont, since we weren't able to survey, there's a lot of question marks this year, but the one nice thing about the populations is that they were large enough that we don't have a concern overall about not having new numbers. It just it makes us kind of fall into more of a conservative stance because we don't have fresh information with these surveys. And the one thing that we did see this year is that there was good brood rearing cover for the birds that were produced locally. And that started to disappear with our drought conditions throughout the year. Everybody throughout the state was dry. The one positive that I did see, we were able to put banding into effect this fall. And with the uh, captures that we had, the age ratios of young to adults was fairly high, which gave us a, a, a good feeling of production was at least locally successful. put this chart on there just to kind of show you overall it's, it's just a little trend chart for some of our local marshes for our wood duck nesting and as you can see it, over the last several years the, that trend's been right in the 300 to 350 range and the birds have not gone up or down uh, with nesting attempts and that's even with increasing it about eight years ago from uh, two to three birds and a daily bag limit. Our resident geese also were trending upward before the last couple of years and which we're hoping to have them eventually drop down somewhere between eight and 10,000 breeding pairs and we're probably up around the 12 to 13,000 currently. I just wanted to show also on the zones when we're talking about the Canada geese, that last slide I showed you was a resident bird. So that's one population that we're looking at and managing. The majority of the birds that come through Vermont is in this yellow zone. That's what we call our Atlantic population. They breed up within this Angava Peninsula area in Northern Quebec. It's in the Nunavut territory and up along that James and Hudson Bay and Angava Bay. Another population that we also have that is managed within the flyway is the North Atlantic population. They're in that little bit of subarctic area and over into Greenland where they breed. And I bring this to your attention because we often have people ask us questions of why don't we have the same season as New York or why don't we have the same season as New Hampshire and within these zones we're managing those different populations so New Hampshire can have a longer season and a larger daily bag limit than the Atlantic population because they're that North Atlantic population is doing better than than the one that comes through Vermont so I just wanted to highlight that really quickly and this is just a slide of the Atlantic population as you can see, back in the early 2000s, we were up around that almost 200,000 breeding pairs. And then it, it's maintained itself that way for about eight to 10 years. And over the last 10 years, we've had a, a drop of somewhere around three to 4% per year. And the reason for that was we had continuing harvest. 
We weren't having production up in the Arctic areas because of that late spring snows. And it was a little bit of a, a lag in the response to the breeding pairs because Canada geese usually are not breeders until they're three years old. So even though we we're harvesting birds, we still had more birds being recruited into the breeding population and it was able to maintain that for a while. But now we're starting to see those effects and that's why we've started to cut back on the season length and the bag limits. Just some numbers of the 2019 hunting season. This comes from our uh, part surveys where hunters send in wings and tail feathers. And also we, we take this out of our harvest information program from a random survey. So we have about 3000 active duck hunters. And as you can see, we have about 6,000 6, um, duck stamps sold each year. So an active duck hunter is somebody who's consistently going out throughout the season where many of our, our duck hunters, they'll go out for a weekend or two and then they switch over to other seasons that are available to them. So you can see that our harvest went up with a few more hunters that were out there. And uh, we had about 5,600 Canada geese that were harvested as an estimate and about 18,000 ducks statewide. And, uh, and we did have some snow geese harvested, but those people were not in that survey. I just know this anecdotally from talking with people. We don't have the numbers yet for 2020. The, those wings and tail feathers are being reviewed right now by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, they're, and then usually what they have is a, what they call a wing bee, where everybody gets together and goes through them quickly. With the pandemic at the moment, we're having to ship those boxes out to people and having them age and sex and, and determine the species and then send them on to a second person that checks them. So it's a little bit slower. But the one good thing that has happened is increase in our um, duck stamp sales slightly this year. And as I mentioned before, that all those surveys come through our harvest information program. When somebody buys a duck stamp, it directs them to this survey and asks them some simple questions about how often they hunt, what species they hunt, and that allows the, the uh, people to send the surveys out to the targeted audience of hunters. Switching over to some of our controlled hunting activities for the year, we're recommending again this year to go with Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays of hunting up at Mud Creek Wildlife Management Area. The first two days of that hunt will be by lottery. Both um, people and blinds will be assigned. And those are also, once the people show up, they have to self-register even though they have a pre-drawn permit. After the first two days on that area, it's completely self-registration. People can sign up. They mark on a map which blind location they're gonna use and what the date is, and that way they can uh, maintain a distance from each other. Moving down to the Dead Creek area down in the Addison, we're only hunting there on Tuesdays and Thursdays, except Friday, the October the 15th, we're recommending as a youth day. And we have five zones that are, are dedicated there Hunters have to supply their own blinds, and all of those sites will be assigned by lottery for the, the zone hunting locations and the personnel. And all of those sites are able to be self-registered one and a half hours before sh shooting hours. And we've uh, dedicated that after a half hour into the registration period, if someone does not show up for their assigned blind site, a standby person can take that site and register for it. When we're talking about all the different hunting seasons, you often hear us talk about the, the zones. Vermont has three hunting zones, the Lake Champlain zone on the western side of the state that is shared with the state of New York. And our board uh, sets the regulations for those that zone. We also have the interior Vermont zone, which is entirely within Vermont and the board sets the regulations for that. And then we have the Connecticut River Zone, which is actually an extension of New Hampshire's Inland Zone, and their board sets the regulations on that particular zone. So we set regulations on two of the three zones that influence the state. With, with just a general outline on zones, we could have a total of four zones within the state, but we wouldn't be able to split our seasons and take advantage of when uh, the different climatic conditions are right and when the birds are migrating through. We have our three zones, so we're allowed to split that into two segments so we can have one break. And if um, we chose to have no zones at all, we would be able to, ex to expand our 
uh, segments into three different hunting zones, but we have chosen over the years to just have our, our three zones and two segments. So moving on to our regulations and bag limits, I just wanted to go over a little bit and expand on what Mark said, the process that we go through. Usually our spring surveys start occurring in May through June. We have our flyway meetings in February to go over the research. And then we bring all that information to the Service Regulatory Commission at the federal level in April. And they start making rules and recommendations for the upcoming year. Usually by August, July and August, a lot of those surveys were having the results come in and we're having the information of updated population levels. And we host flyway meetings again in August and September. And then in October, the Service Regulatory Commission makes the final decision for the, the next year's framework. What's supposed to happen is those frameworks come to us in December, and then we move on and start formulating public meetings, come to the board, and they give us the final framework dates in February, at which point we make a decision in April on our seasons, have to have our, our dates back to the federal government by April 30th, and then by June 1st, they're, they're supposed to have those out and into the federal register so that we can document our seasons and have our seasons move forward. And all of our seasons usually start by September 1st. I just threw this table in here a little bit to show what actually happens. Uh, the first year we did this was in 2016 and the dates were hit pretty well. It, you know, a little bit later on some of those. And then over the last four years, uh, the dates became later and later. And as you can see, the final frameworks are supposed to be to us in February 25th. And many of them are in March, June, even August. So we were working off of what the Service Regulatory Committee meeting uh, provided to us in hopes that nothing had changed. And then when we're supposed to have our final seasons into the uh, Federal Register by June 1st. And as you can see, it progressively got worse over the last few years as um, people within the interior department, the duck seasons as a lower priority. And you can see over the last two years, the uh, 28th of August was only two days before our seasons were supposed to start. And if that had not been registered, we would have had to do some quick press releases and we might not have had a season. So we have made comments on this throughout through the flyway. Mark has been part of that. And uh, our concerns have been brought forward and hopefully with new um, head of the interior department, some of that may change in the near future. So working on to our September Canada goose season, our recommendation is within the interior and Lake Champlain zone to run it from September 1 to 25. We'll have an eight bird daily bag limit. And within the Connecticut zone, they're still recommending a five bird daily bag limit. For youth weekend, we're recommending the last weekend in September, September 25th and 26th. This will be for all ducks, geese, mergansers, and coots. Same regulations as during our regular season. Within the interior and Lake Champlain zone, youth are considered to be 17 years of age and younger. Within the Connecticut River zone, New Hampshire still keeps their age at 15 years and younger. Any youth that is going out has to be accompanied by an unarmed person of 18 years of age or older who can assist them in all other manners other than shooting. For our woodcock recommendation this year, we're, we're proposing to open it September 25th and run it through November 8th. If you notice the September 25th is proposing to open it on the same day as our grouse and small game season for rabbits. That is something new that was available to us this year before we were not able to open it until October. And so we decided to take advantage of that and allow, um, hopefully allow people to uh, per participate in woodcock and grouse hunting at the same time. For woodcock, we're looking at a 45 day season and a three bird daily bag limit. The common snipe season we're proposing to run at the same time as the woodcock season. So again, September 25th to November 8th and the daily bag limit on snipe is eight. I just brought this up here, uh, part of the study some of you have heard about is the Woodcock study with a PhD student out of the University of Maine. And this just shows some of the birds that we, we tagged were up in the Missisquoi area over in the Ohegan Basin in the Northeast Kingdom. And then down in the Western part of the state down in West Haven down in the TNC uh, Nature Preserve. We had a total of 18 birds tagged 
and uh, they track those migrations down through to the south. You can see that many of them like to winter down in Virginia and the Carolinas, and we even have a few that headed their way down into uh, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. It just shows you the extent that these birds are migrating, and we're looking at uh, survival of birds and migration, habitat use pre-migration and during migration, and some of the southern states are tagging birds right now, and we'll be watching those birds come back to the north and, and looking at uh, habitat use. One of the things that is missing within some of the population models for woodcock is that survival during migration and then habitat use. Moving on to the duck season recommendations. This is the general duck season. We're allowed 60 days and that can run anywhere from September 26th to January 31st, of which you're allowed a six bird daily bag. What we are recommending for the interior zone of Vermont is October 13th and run it straight through to December 11th. Lake Champlain zone, we're recommending the 13th, running it through October 17th, taking about a two week break, opening it up again on October 30th and running it through December 31st, or sorry, December 23rd. And then the Connecticut River zone, New Hampshire hasn't decided on theirs at this point. October 13th is a Wednesday this year. Last year we switched over to recommending a Wednesday opener every other year and then Saturdays on the, the alternative years. The bag limits have remained the same, two mallards with only one hen, three wood ducks, and the other one I wanted to point out is scop. It still has a restrictive season where we have the option of 20 days with a two bird daily bag limit and 40 days with a one bird daily bag limit. We can be more restrictive on that, but we chose to recommend to you the more liberal season. Mergansers also has a 60 day season. They are considered an, uh, outside of the regular ducks and they're allowed a five bird daily bag limit on top of your six birds for the regular uh, duck season. We chose to recommend the same seasons within the zones as the other ducks. And so technically you could potentially have a daily bag of uh, 11 birds total, five mergansers, six ducks of other species but of that, you're only allowed two hooded mergansers within your bag limit. So for the migratory portion of Canada geese, the Atlantic population for the hunting season, we're allowed 30 days of which we can only start from October 10th and we can run that through February 5th, any, any uh, 30 days within that period. The one change this year is we had two bird daily bag limit last year and we're only allowed a one bird bag limit this year because of the uh, population decline and wanting to be more conservative to allow those birds to rebound. So that recommendation is for both the interior of Vermont and Lake Champlain zone. The Connecticut River zone will be run by the North Atlantic population and those seasons will again will be set by New Hampshire. I just wanted to show you some of the band recoveries from the Atlantic population and, and why we have the restrictions of dates. If you look down here on the Vermont section, we had one bird that was taken late in the September goose season, which we, we try not to see because we're trying to set our seasons to allow those migrants to go through. And the vast majority of the harvest is in October. You see 30 of those birds were in October and only a few of them were in November. So we put the vast majority of the days in October to provide opportunity on those migrant birds without overstressing them as our goal. And that's why we have the early September season to try to target our resident population. For snow geese, we're allowed a 107 day season, which can run from October 1st through March 10th. You're allowed a 25 bird bag limit per day. We're proposing to take advantage of that whole 107 days and run it from October 1 to December 31 of 2021. Reopen the season on February 24th of 22 and run it through March 10th. That would be the, the hunting season for greater snow geese. We can reopen that again on March 11th and run it through April 23rd, which is the Friday before the youth turkey season. And that is considered a conservation order where we're allowed to set those up outside of normal hunting seasons. And that bag limit would be 15. For Atlantic Brant, we're allowed a 50 day season, a two bird daily bag limit. And we're recommending that to run from October 13th, which is the same date that we're recommending to start the Canada goose season and the duck season, running that straight through to De December 1st. The birds usually come through that mid-October to 
late October period unless they have a failure of uh, production and then they may come through a little early in October at, at some years. But that bracket of 50 days is the uh, general time period when the birds come through the state. We are allowed a falconry season and we've recommended that that run with any of the open seasons and any of the available game species that are out there, woodcock, snipe, ducks, and geese. The shooting hours are the same as somebody with a firearm, half hour before sunrise to sunset. But the difference with falconry is the federal framework only allows three birds per day with the falcons. I threw this up to show you a little bit about the bird abundance. This is from eBird. It's where people submit their observations to a lab in Cornell. And the different color codes here, the boxes are the season we had last year and early segments versus the late segment within the Champlain zone. And the, the blue line is the mallards and black ducks, which is what a lot of people key in on. And then again, they key in on the black line, which is your diving ducks. So what we're recommending this year, slightly different than last year, is running it from October 13th and going through to the 17th, which would fall right about in this line right here, which hits the close to the peak of the early migrants of wood ducks and teal and then also starts to hit that peak of any, any duck season. And then we would close it from the 18th through the 29th and reopen it on the 30th, which hits the peak of all ducks. And we would run it from the 30th to December 23rd, which is fairly close to where we were last year. We were off by about five days. And we hit both the, the peak of the mallards and black ducks and pretty much that high period when the diving ducks are going through there. Broke it down a little bit more to some of your early migrants, which is your wood ducks, your teal, and pintails and widgeon. And you can see that first segment of the 12th, ours would be the 13th right about here, when we run it through the 17th, hits that peak of the teal and the wood ducks. And then we, we miss a little bit of that, but we open it back up on the 30th, we still hit that peak of teal, and we run it right through to the end of the year where they really drop off towards the end of October, early November for the early migrants. And then the same framework, for our diving ducks and some of our later migrants, you can see here the, the green is all diving ducks. And the, one, the common one that people are after is the common golden eye and scop. We have a little bit of bump here. So our framework for the, the 13th through the 17th, we start hitting some of those birds. We're really on that framework. We're looking at the early season migrants. We open it back up on the 30th, which runs right about here. We capture that bump and scop that are coming through the area. And we're also grabbing uh, the early part of that peak where the all diving ducks come through. And then if we run it from the 30th through the 23rd, which is about in this region, we hit that plateau where the diving ducks are coming through and the, and the golden eyes are really are building up in, in higher numbers. This little bump on the outside of our season is just a, a bump where the golden eyes come through. So we tried to capture as much opportunity as possible for all of the species that are out there. I just wanted to mention again our state duck stamp that up until this point before the EPA funds that we have has been really the, the bread and butter of our money available to acquire wetlands and to do restoration work. And it has been in, in, in place since 1985 and they started the first duck stamp sales in 1986. And here's just a quick slide of those sales. From 89, those early days, you have collectors that buy the stamps and you have really high numbers for those first few years. And then you can see after about five to 10 years, it plateaued off again, right at that 6,000 level. And you can see that duck hunters have been consistently um, staying with, with the hunting season, whether it's been a good season or not uh, from migration standpoint, but they're very, very persistent hunting. We don't have a lot of churn as we do in some of our species that are hunted. And I know this, this slide here kind of breaks all rules of showing in PowerPoint, but I wanted just to show you some information on the EPA program that Mark was mentioning that we were all working on within the department. It's providing 3.9 million, close to 3.9 million the first two years. And we're looking at another three and a half or three and a half million over fiscal year 22 and 23 of which we promised to try to acquire and re do restoration work on three to five wetland acquisition projects, restore 40% of that land and, and restore the hydrology on 100 acres. Uh, with a number of staff members working on this, we've already 
closed on or are under contract for nine properties of which it's over 2000 acres that we've acquired. Over 1300 of that is restorable. So we're up to 66%. And with the acquisition, we spent basically 2.9 million in these first two years. And have also brought in almost 1.2 million from uh, partnering organizations such as Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, TNC, DU, and other groups. And we estimate from the work that we're doing and planning to do on the restoration projects, we'll spend about half a million dollars on the restoration work, which includes putting in ditch plugs, seeding down grasslands, planting trees, and various activities. So I just want to put that out there and say, you know, that's a, a very good source for us. And we've added substantially to some of our WMAs within the state and across the state. And with that, uh, just finish up. And if there's any questions that people have, I can answer those.